Hello and welcome. Thank you for coming to tonight's How To Academy event and thank you Steps Travel for sponsoring. Shortly joining us on stage are undoubtedly two of the most iconoclastic and distinguished thinkers of our time, Richard Dawkins and Stephen Pinker. They'll be speaking about rationality and then moving on to audience questions. But for now, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Richard Dawkins and Stephen Pinker. Newspapers and magazines produce ranked lists of public intellectuals throughout the world. Steven Pinker is always high in such lists, and he's my favorite public intellectual. <laughs> he introduces non-specialist readers to his own expert subject, while simultaneously contributing to the expert literature of that subject. The amazing thing is that his own expert subject turns out to be subjects in the plural. He knows so much about so many different things and is a world expert in all of them. Linguistics in the language instinct, words and rules, the stuff of thought. Cognitive and evolutionary psychology in how the mind works. The interplay between genes and environment in the blank slate. History in the better angels of our nature. Philosophy, history of ideas, passionate political advocacy in enlightenment now. In the sense of style, he even passes on tips and tricks of what makes him such a marvelous writer. And today we have rationality. I've read it three times and learned something new with each reading. I strongly recommend it. But then I strongly recommend all his books. <laughs> it seems unfair to single out the latest one. If there's any one book that you haven't yet read, just do it. I'd like to add he's a man of intellectual courage. When Larry Summers, the then president of Harvard, was threatened with a no-confidence vote because he'd given a lecture which countenanced the possibility of discussing an unfashionable idea, Steve was asked whether Summers' talk was within the pale of legitimate academic discourse. Steve replied, good grief, shouldn't everything be within the pale of legitimate academic discourse as long as it presents as long as it's presented with some degree of rigor. That's the difference between a university and a madrasa. Amen, say I. <laughs> After all that, it seems a bit of an anticlimax to do the usual thing and say something about his biography. <laughs> He's originally Canadian, but has taught at Stanford, MIT, and Harvard. You can't do better than that. He's now the Johnston Professor of Psychology at Harvard, he loves peanuts and Dilbert cartoons <laughs> and Jewish jokes. <laughs> Steve, um, before we get on to rationality, I uh, mentioned in connection with how the mind works that you're one of the leaders of evolutionary psychology. And it does come into rationality as well. Um, I'm continually mystified by the incredible vicious hostility that this subject arouses. Uh, I was once talking to a, an otherwise very reasonable and sensible sober philosopher and as soon as he heard the name Pinker he practically had an apoplexy <laughs> and the, the reason was purely evolutionary psychology. Um, I'm not sure I understand the hostility but do you? Uh, I, I do because I, it became the subject of one of my books after writing How the Mind Works where I combined the two big ideas, the computational theory of mind, the explanation of how a piece of matter can achieve intelligence, with uh, evolution, namely where complex uh, systems such as the human mind originate. And uh, I don't even consider myself an evolutionary psychologist so much as thinking that evolution is one of several perspectives that makes for a satisfying explanation. And here I... I got uh, it better. It, 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 it better. And here I uh, appeal to a, 
a system by, I believe, your mentor, Nico Tinbergen, yes. that to explain any behavior, you have to characterize it at several levels. It's neurophysiological basis, it's development in the organism, it's phylogeny in, over the course of evolutionary history, and it's adaptive function. Just as with any complex object, the first question you ask is, what is it for? What, what, what was it designed to do? And, and the argument is for, and actually, I, I have to credit you with this argument, in the blind watchmaker, you uh, noted that the, what natural selection can explain and nothing else can explain is how signs of design, the illusion of engineering, can appear in the natural world. So that's the extent to which I'm an evolutionary psychologist. Yeah. Well, I suppose that they feel it's fine to talk about Darwinism for physical structures, yes. but when it comes to behavior or the mind, that's kind of off limits, especially if it's human. Well, it is, and it was in part the reaction that, uh, some of the reactions that I got to how the mind works that uh, led me to realize that these were not just scientific uh, disagreements, that there were moral and emotional and political colorings to the very idea of human nature. Uh, in, and in particular, many people, uh, many intellectuals, many critics, many writers seem to feel that the idea that we are blank slates, that there is no such thing as human nature, that evolution did not shape our um, our, our, our motives, our emotions, our ways of learning, that that's somehow politically more desirable. We should hope that it's true uh, and pretend that it's true. So I wanted to answer that, your, the very question, why, uh, now any particular hypothesis about an adaptive function could be false, let's hope so many of them are false because that's what makes it science, um, but uh, many people uh, treat them not as hypotheses that are true or false, but hypotheses that are, are evil to think. And I wanted to know why, and I think there, there are a number of reasons. One of them is that if we're blank slates, because nothing equals nothing equals nothing, it's the ultimate guarantor of equality. The men can't be women, different from women, and, and races can't be different, ethnic groups can't be different, because we're all zero, there's nothing there, so there can't be any innate differences. Now, I think it's a non sequitur, or at least it's a, maybe it's a fallacy of affirming the consequent, because even if it's true that if we are identical, if we, because, we have, because there's nothing uh, in the brain at birth, that would make it easy to endorse political equality. On the other hand, it is not the case that if you endorse political equality, you have to believe in the, in the blank slate. I do endorse political equality uh, for, for all, all humans. Uh, but it doesn't depend on our being blank slates or clones. It just depends on the moral commitment that people ought to be treated as individuals and not prejudged by the statistics of their, their uh, race or sex or ethnicity. That's one of these. The other is, uh, as I call it, the fear of, of inequality. There's the fear of imperfectibility. That is, if we're blank slates, it holds out the hope that anything that we don't like about human behavior now we can kind of condition out of the species with the right education, the right parenting, the right media, and so we're not doomed to endless strife and conflict and, and bigotry. Uh, it's just the uh, uh, pernicious conditioning of this society, but we can dream of a better society, even a utopia, in which we bring up a generation of kids that don't have these flaws. Again, I think that I, I, my, my own response, and the blank slate had these reasons why evolutionary psychology and behavioral genetics and to some, and to some extent uh, cognitive and affective neuroscience, all of the biological approaches to, to the mind, why they are so um, uh, politically incendiary. Uh, the fear of, of imperfectibility is the idea that we are, that there's a kind of reactionary politics that evolution leads you to, well, you can't change human nature, and so why bother trying to improve society? We're stuck with all of the, um, the awful traits that we see. Again, that's a non, I argue in the blank slate in replying to this that it is also a non sequitur because human nature by pretty much any account is complicated. There are lots of different parts to it. And even if we have some unsavory uh, urges or impulses, we also have, there are other parts of human nature that can uh, push back against them. 
we have self-control. We don't, if there's food on the table, we don't just immediately stuff our mouths, but we wait till the appropriate moment. That's why we have these big outsized frontal lobes. We have empathy so that we don't just um, exploit uh, everyone uh, um, at will. We have um, norms, uh, uh, rule, tacit rules that we feel that respectable people just don't do. We have uh, cognitive processes, reason, where we can set up problems like violence or war, try to figure out institutions that can reduce them and try to implement them. Uh, and we have language that can share them. So it, the fact that human nature exists doesn't mean that we're locked into a, uh, a particular social system. I think that brings us into uh, jumping ahead into, into fairly late in, in rationality. Um, what do you describe, I think, the most depressing finding <laughs> in psychology ever, um, the, the fact that, that we are, all of us, more likely to believe what's politically congenial to us rather than what's actually supported by the evidence. Um, <clears throat> I was depressed indeed by the experiment you described where, um, well, you, you describe it where, where they change the labels on the... Yes. On the so the experiment is you, um, <coughs> there's a, a fake um, social science experiment, I mean, that is, it's just, it's made up for the purpose of the experiment, that, um, as I recall, it shows whether uh, gun control is effective in reducing the rate of crime, this being more of a, an American <laughs> hot button than a, Brit than a British one, but uh, politically inflammatory, and the right and the left have staked out opposite sides, if, and the numbers were <laughs> jiggered so that the the uh, uh, answer to the question, did gun control reduce crime, doesn't pop out of the data. You have to actually, um, uh, in fact, the, uh, the um, numbers that appear on the page at first glance seem to show that it was effective, but then when you scale it by the proportions instead of the absolute numbers, because the cities over which it was calculated were different sizes, so the fact that there were more murders uh, in absolute terms was not informative because they were fewer in relative terms. So you just had to do like one more step of mental arithmetic. So you had to do a little bit of critical thinking in order to spot the mistake. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Uh, and so the so that that was the setup. There was a seductive but wrong answer. I mean, it wasn't you know, rocket science as we say, but it did require one extra mental step. And the uh, comparisons were first of all, um, did the were the respondents uh, numerate or not? That is, did they show in an independent test that they were uh, familiar with, with uh, handling numbers? Were they on the left or the right by self-identification? Did the results seem to support uh, the efficacy of gun control or not? And uh, they also had a control where, just to make sure it wasn't the complexity of the problem itself, instead of does gun control reduce crime, it was does this skin cream reduce rashes, where presumably the left and the right don't have strong opinions on whether an, our, a, a fictitious skin cream is effective or not. So that was a kind of control. Well, what they found was that when it came to the skin cream, not surprisingly, people who were um, highly, uh, were, who were f uh, familiar with numbers uh, were more likely to draw the correct conclusion, that is, they scaled the absolute numbers by the, by the, the, the base rate. Uh, people who were less numerate uh, kind of fell for it, and it didn't matter whether they were uh, on the left or on the right. But when you switch it to um, the efficacy of gun control, now the, uh, and you switch the column headings, so the same numbers for half the subject show that it supported gun control, that it showed it was effective, the, for the other half, it showed that it was, um, if anything, it seemed to increase crime. Now, the, um, the uh, innumerate people, uh, once again, were, fell for the bigger numbers in all cases. The numerate people, for the, um, uh, the uh, difficult case, they were able to spot the, um, uh, the, the effect. But for the easy case, they, or the, sorry, I said that wrong. When it supported, if they were on the left and they were highly numerate, they correctly spotted the um, seductive wrong answer if it went against the favored liberal position, namely if it uh, showed that 
gun control worked. They were not seduced by the misleading numbers. If it showed that gun control did not work, they were no better than the, uh, the enumerate people. Conversely, for people on the right, if the correct interpretation of the data was that gun control was um, effective, it went over their heads even though they were mathematically competent to pick it out. Uh, if, on the other hand, it pointed to the uh, conclusion that they didn't like, then their eagle eyes spotted it. So the bottom line was that when people, uh, even though in general, high intelligence, high numeracy, high critical thinking skills uh, inoculate us against common fallacies, against going with a superficial impression. If it goes against people's politics, then all of that numerical skill goes out the window. They just zoom in on what they believe to be true, or what they wanted to be true, according to the ideology of their political coalition. This is deeply depressing indeed. Um, do, do we all suffer from that? So it is, it, I, 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 sadly, the answer is more or less yes. I don't want to say every last one of us, but um, it's, a very, it's one of the, perhaps the most robust of the 200 or so fallacies that cognitive psychologists and behavioral economists have documented. This is according to an excellent bu book by Keith Stanovich called The Bias That Divides Us, in which he showed that it's equally powerful uh, among left-wingers and right-wingers, and uh, high intelligence is no protection. Unlike most of the other fallacies, like um, arguing by, uh, from, from anecdote, the sunk cost fallacy, where if you're smarter, you tend to be less susceptible to them. But for the my side bias, as the gun control study showed, being smart doesn't help you. I must say, I feel guilty of this. I mean, I, I empathize when you said somewhere in the book, who among us doesn't prefer to read an editorial that we agree with and one that we don't agree with. And, and Feels I great. the point of, of, yeah. of reading the Daily Telegraph every day just in that <laughs> <laughs> to counteract that. Yeah. Um, but anyway, it is, it is deeply depressing. Um, <clears throat> I think we both admire Stephen Fry very much, and I was puzzled to read one of his books somewhere he said that he's an empiricist but not a rationalist. I thought they were the same thing, I must confess. I'm obviously very ignorant, but can you explain the difference? <laughs> so this, it goes back to the uh, uh, age of reason and the enlightenment, and this is a, a kind of introductory philosophy uh, dichotomy, or at least a way of organizing the philosophers. It has a slightly different meaning in my own field of cognitive science and, and cognitive psychology and linguistics. There, if you're an empiricist, you believe in the blank slate. If you're a rationalist, you believe the mind comes equipped with lots of uh, innate capabilities. But I think in the philosophical sense, uh, it referred to philosophers who uh, wanted to root an understanding of reality in, in reason and logic, in first principles, what we might pejoratively call uh, from the armchair. And uh, in, in, empiricist would mean that you have to go out into the world and look. So you, uh, uh, Francis Bacon, John Locke, David Hume, um, David Hartley, Bishop Berkeley were all called empiricists. Uh, the classic uh, rationalists were Spinoza, Descartes, and uh, Leibniz. But we should all be both, should, should we? We should all be both, yeah. yes. Um, we just mentioned Hume. Um, Obviously, you're a huge admirer of Hume. You quote him a lot in, in the book. Uh, did you know that there's a movement in Edinburgh, did we succeed, I think, to rename the David Hume Tower? It, Hume has been cancelled, in other words. <laughs> that, that, is, that is depressing. And I, I forget the infraction, but did they turn up some... Uh, oh, I don't think he actually owned slaves, but he probably... Maybe owned stock in a company that... dodgy about, yes. Yeah. Well, what's, de what's depressing is that it is a, a particular uh, failure of rationality, which is that um, in other times, in other historical periods, uh, uh, all mortal humans, at least in part, go with the prevailing norms. That uh, it wasn't that only that bad people kept slaves or owned stocks and companies that traded slaves. It kind of everyone did it. and. It would take some kind of super uh, human, angelic, moral sense to actually defy 
everything you know, everyone you know, uh, uh, and that it's, uh, we, we should ought to judge people by what they uh, believed and held relative to the, um, uh, the, the prevailing norms of the day. Not that we should make the moral judgments themselves, uh, because slavery was immoral whether it was questioned or not. Uh, the, we don't have to be moral relativists, but in judging individuals uh, in terms of their moral fiber, uh, their moral, ca moral character, uh, one has to uh, look at the society in which they, they were born and, and uh, uh, traded ideas, particularly since this is a high, much more moral stance. It's, it's not amoral in giving a pass to evil people in the past. On the contrary, it is a prod to us to take a look at what beliefs that we have that we might consider completely unexceptionable that our descendants might find uh, horrific. And only if we realize that, that human beings aren't divided into good people and bad people, but often are absorb without even questioning them some of the practices of, of the day, which, they, which ought to be uh, challenged, doesn't mean that everyone who hasn't yet challenged them is a bad person. Do you have a nominee in, in 100 years' time? Will Pinker and Dawkins be cancelled <laughs> retrospectively for, and if so, for what? Is well, we might, are we going to um, go out for chicken after, after, uh, uh, after this for dinner? So, sorry, again. Are we going to go out for um, a nice um, a steak or a piece of chicken or a fillet of fish? Well, it's, that's the it's, obvious candidate, isn't that's it? An, that's one candidate. I th and there, there are others, and it is uh, a kind of <clears throat> illuminating exercise to think about uh, what practices uh, we um, often don't even question. Perhaps uh, the degree of criminal punishment, that we, it might exceed what is effective as a deterrent. Yeah. And if the goal of criminal punishment is to <clears throat> reduce the uh, amount of crime by setting up incentives that will inhibit people from committing them, uh, we may uh, punish people above and beyond or in different ways than, than, uh, than what would re reduce the, the uh, amount of wrongdoing. Uh, nuclear weapons, the, the fact that we possess nuclear weapons, we've just been reminded by Putin's threats that they aren't just um, hypothetical uh, devices that kept it kept in storage, but uh, if they're there, they could be used. The fact that they exist could be Does that seen. cause any, any revision of the better angels of our nature, by the way? Um, well, it's the, the it, it does show that um, it, it is a reversal of the process called the, called the long piece. The fact that for 77 years after World War II, there was a, well, there's an absence of interstate war in Europe. There was a reduction in interstate war across the globe and a reduction in the number of deaths in, in war. So far, it hasn't um, <clears throat> reversed it in the sense of sending the curves back up to where they used to be, say in the 1960s when the war in Vietnam was raging, but it was uh, certainly a, a shattering of a precedent. And most people, most nations are appalled and uh, there's a good reason that they're appalled. Yeah. And, and I would have, and to be honest, I would have, uh, if, if I had entered a prediction market, if I was forced to make a bet as to what is the probability that, um, uh, that, that Russia would actually invade and try to annex or, or uh, conquer territory, I, uh, I would have lost my shirt. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson is among those who are advocating a virtual country called Rationalia. And, um, the, the rule about rationalia is there's only a one-line constitution. All policy shall be based on the weight of evidence, which sounds great to me. But he reports in his book that, we, that um, he got an awful lot of stick for this. And, yeah. and a lot of people said, what a horrible idea that, <laughs> that scientists should have any say in the matter of that kind of thing. I mean, are you going to sign up for Neil's rationalia? Well, I, I think it's incomplete. I mean, he is, by the way, his, um, the basic idea has, um, d does have some currency among uh, policy analysts and public servants in the demand for evidence-based policy. And there's an organization that, um, that I support called Apolitical that um, tries to exchange empirically vetted best practices among policy analysts and public service uh, servants across the globe. So it's a step in the, in the uh, direction. The reason that it's incomplete, the two reasons that it's incomplete, one of them is that 
Rationality is always in service of a goal. In fact, I, early on in the book, where I have no choice but to try to define rationality, I say it's the, the uh, use of knowledge to attain a goal. And going back to David Hume, he pointed out that, uh, the, that rationality itself can't tell you what that goal must be. So if you apply rational means to a, um, a destructive end, you're behaving in one sense rationally, but it may not be commendable, it may not be admirable. And so the, you can't have government, you can't simply say government should base policy on evidence and now we know how to govern because what are the, uh, the ends, what are the goals? And, and the, uh, there are differences among people in what those goals are. In, say, v Vladimir Putin, the goal is to um, assert the glory and the preeminence of Russian civilization. Someone else, the goal might be um, uh, human life and, uh, and, and safety. They're, each could pursue a rational means to those conflicting goals. Now, as it happens, I don't, I think Hume can be taken too far. I do think we can uh, discuss the advisability of different goals in terms of how consistent they are with other goals that we have, and in particular, goals that we claim for ourselves, like presumably Putin would rather be alive than dead. Um, and that, that means that it, you can say that it is irrational or at least inconsistent uh, if he were to deny that very right to others, which he claims for himself. He would surely agree with you that what we're looking for is self-consistency, but I thought he was simply saying you can't simply assume a, a, a moral premise. I think Sam Harris is the only person I know who does say that, 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 that you actually can derive morals from purely scientific reasoning. But I, I don't think Hume actually would deny that he surely he's the le leading exponent of the idea that you want to look at self-consistency in, in yes. the reasoning that you apply after your moral premise. Yes, and if you, um, if you marry that to the unexceptionable um, goal that people have to be alive and healthy and happy and well-fed, and uh, um, then uh, that does, uh, and, and it is true that on narrow logical grounds, you don't have to prefer being healthy to sick. And, and in fact, Hume actually draws this point out. He says there's nothing rational about wanting to be healthy or, or, or uh, uh, as opposed to sick or rich than, or even comfortably well off rather than impoverished, that those aren't logical truths, they're just goals, that presumably ones that for intelligible reasons, natural selection installed in us. Uh, once you uh, make the leap and say, yeah, call me crazy, but I really would rather be alive than dead and well-fed than starving. Uh, I can't justify it logically, but that's just the way I am. Uh, then a lot follows out of logical consistency. Uh, the book is very filled with Bayesian reasoning. Obviously, you're a great um, devotee of Bayesian reasoning. Can you explain that without algebra? Yes. Uh, there are, uh, this is the rule um, discovered by the Rem Reverend Thomas Bayes in the 18th century on how to calibrate your degree of credence in a hypothesis according to the strength of, of uh, evidence. And it, the basic conceptual leap that Bayes gave us is that you can, con <coughs> as long as you uh, don't either believe something or reject it, but you have degrees of confidence, degrees of, con of, of uh, credence in an idea, uh, you can conceive of those degrees of confidence as probabilities. Between zero, you're positive that it's false. One, you're positive that it's true. 0.5, you, you could go either way, and so on. Now, as soon as you take that leap, that you translate your degree of belief of, in a hypothesis into a number, then the mathematics of probability apply. And he spelled out one way in which just the definition of conditional pro probability can be applied to how we ought to calibrate our degree of belief according to the evidence. And, and you can put it into words. The, the reason that it's worth thinking, it's, only, it's actually got only three terms in it um, and just a little bit of arithmetic, <clears throat> but many advocates of rationality, including members of the uh, self-designated rationality community, uh, believe that uh, 
Bayes' rule is probably the cognitive tool that would go the farthest in making all of us more rational than we naturally would be. And, and uh, for those of you who are familiar with the, the ideas of Daniel Kahneman, the author of Thinking Fast and Slow, winner of a Nobel Prize and the co-discoverer with Amos Tversky of many, many human fallacies, Kahneman um, and Tversky identified a failure of Bayesian reasoning as one of the most common human fallacies, in particular, the neglect of the first term in Bayes' theorem. And here's, here's how it works. What Bayes' theorem gives you, what the, the deliverable, the, uh, uh, the goal, the term on the left-hand side of the equation is your degree of belief in a hypothesis um, uh, contingent on the evidence. Uh, to, to get that, we all want that. Should I, do I have a disease? Um, is, uh, did so-and-so uh, you know, commit the crime? Uh, any hypothesis where there's some, still some uncertainty. To get that, you start off with the priors, and that is an element from Bayes' theorem that's actually escaped from probability theory and has now become part of every, every day's vocabulary. I think it probably just happened in the last decade or so that, uh, well, my priors are, are, are different from your priors, or my priors are that he probably did it. Uh, that simply comes from the first term in Bayes' theorem, namely, how much credence do you have in the idea before you've even looked at the evidence? just how plausible it is based on everything you know coming to you, the... You do the mention the problem with that, that it, it sounds like prejudice. I mean, it, well, it's, it's, yes, it, in, indeed, right. <clears throat> and, and it could, it, ideally, it shouldn't just be any old belief that you have confidence in, but something where there is, there are, there is a base rate that grounds that uh, prior. So in the case of a um, concrete example that's often uh, raised is, given that you have the positive test result for a disease, do you actually have the disease? We all want to know that when we get tested for prostate cancer or cervical cancer or, or COVID. And um, one way of calibrating the, the, that base rate, that first term, without it just being a, you know, a gut feeling, in which case you can use Bayes' theorem to prove anything you want, uh, is the base rate in the population. That is, what percentage of people walking around um, say, what percentage of men have prostate cancer in a certain age range? And that's, that's your prior. Before you even look at the test result, that's, how, that's where you start. Uh, then you multiply that by the <coughs> likelihood, and likelihood in this context doesn't just mean probability, but it specifically means if the hypothesis were true, then would you observe the evidence that you're observing? So if you had the disease, uh, would you get a positive test result, or if, if it's not a test but rather a set of symptoms, would it show those, those uh, symptoms? Uh, and in, in the jargon of medical testing, that's called the sensitivity of the test, that is the probability of the data given the hypothesis. Now, that says nothing about whether it's true or not, it just says if it were true, would you see that, that evidence? And if that's true, then it jacks up your, your estimate. Then you take those two terms, you multiply them together, then you just divide it by how common is the evidence across the board, sometimes called the, the marginal. Um, and that's base, that's base theorem. Now, how does it work out? The reason that it, even though there are circumstances in which it is unintuitive, and Tversky and Kahneman gave many famous examples, uh, it can be made intuitive, and it, we actually have versions of it in our collective folklore. In, for example, uh, Carl Sagan's um, motto, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, itself a, a pithy uh, distillation of a point made by Hume, namely when someone, uh, Hume's example is, if someone reports having witnessed a miracle, um, uh, should you believe it? Now that, that would be a high second term in Bayes' theorem, namely, if a miracle occurred, well, you can't miss it. Uh, and then that doesn't tell you whether a miracle occurred. You'd have to, you have to calibrate that by um, how, what is more likely, and these are the priors, that all of the laws of physics as, we've uh, as we understand them are, are false, or some guy got something wrong. You know, he was drunk, he had a memory failure. Well, uh, given that the laws of physics, there's lots of reasons to believe it even before you, whether or not someone reports a miracle. Uh, if you do hear a miracle, even if the guy seems like he's telling the truth, 
chances are it's more likely that he was wrong than that the laws of physics are wrong. So that's, that's an example of Bayesian reasoning. Another one is the advice given to medical students. Again, uh, a uh, pushing back at the base rate neglect that Kahneman uh, documented, Kahneman and Tversky. If you hear hoofbeats outside uh, a window, don't expect to see a zebra. And this is pushing back against the bad habit of medical students having read about all these exotic diseases to reason from the symptom to the disease, forgetting about the base rate. I think the, the medical examples are particularly important and convincing because time and again, you hear of people who get a diagnosis or, or, and, and they get it wrong because they forget about the base rate. And, uh, As do doctors. It's not just, doctors, it's not yes, just patients. Indeed. I can give an exa concrete example. Yes. Um, and this is, it's been, uh, you've all probably heard that there are some findings in psychology that have failed to replicate. This is one that is highly replicable, going back 50 years, and it even has a name it's called the medical diagnosis problem. So, um, <clears throat> suppose that the um, uh, probability that a woman has breast cancer is 1%. There is a test for breast cancer, and if a woman does have the disease, then uh, the test result is positive 90% of the time. But like many medical tests, there are some false positives, and there is a, uh, the false positive rate is 0.9. A woman tests positive, what are the chances that she has the disease? Okay, so there's a, a 0.01 chance that uh, any randomly selected woman has the, has the disease, a 0.9 chance that if she does have the disease, the test result comes out positive, a 0.09 chance that if she doesn't have the disease, the test comes out positive. She tests positive, what are the chances that she has the, the, uh, the cancer? You can ponder that for, for a minute. The most popular answer is 90%, including among a, a sample of doctors. The correct answer, according to Bayes' theorem, is 9%. That's a big difference. It's a difference between... That's a very important difference. That's a very important difference. It makes a difference between between like you and probably have it or you probably don't have it. Yeah. And the, where people go wrong is they forget about that 1% base rate. Yes. They just think of the image, the representative image of someone with cancer. They take a test, it comes out positive, and that dominates their thinking. A better example, maybe even a better example, despite the fact that this is one of the classics, is uh, 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 imagine, consider um, Penelope. Penelope is um, very, uh, has a highly refined aesthetic sense. She likes to spend her um, summers in uh, Tuscany. She wrote a sonnet for her boyfriend uh, for his birthday. What are the, what are the chances that her uh, university major is art history? What are the chances that her university major is psychology? Everyone says, well, it's gotta be art history. Um, however, for every heart history major, there are probably a hundred psychology majors, uh, just that much more popular. Uh, the fact that she fits the stereotype of a um, art history major uh, isn't the only thing that you should consider if across the board, regardless of people's tastes and what they give their boyfriends for, for, for their birthday, just chances are much, are much higher that, she's gonna, that anyone's going to be a psychology major, there are that many more of them. So that's another example of base rate neglect. Signal detection theory, um, somewhat similar, uh, but um, something I know a little bit more about. Can you explain about yes. signal detection theory, maybe in the context of courts of law, which you, you do mention in the book? Yes, yeah, so signal detection theory is a term that is familiar to psychologists. It, more generally, it can also be called statistical decision theory. It, the, the mathematics are almost identical. Whenever you hear of a significance test, it's significant at probably less than 0.05. Statistical decision theory is the body of reasoning that, that um, uh, allows you to say that. It's basically the, the problem that it solves for any tool of rationality, there's always a goal. I mentioned that the reason that we uh, want to know Bayes' theorem is it tells us how to calibrate our degree of uh, credence in a hypothesis. Signal detection theory takes the next, next step and says, given that we're uncertain about almost everything, uh, you know, maybe we're 90% certain, maybe we're 10% certain, uh, but we're virtually never 100% certain or 0% certain. What do you do about it if you have to make a decision? So in the case of, say, a cancer diagnosis, 
do you operate or not? And if, you're, if your degree of, of, of belief in a, in, in a diagnosis is, say, 0.8 or 0.7, well, what do you do? What do you do if you're a doctor? What do you do if, you do if you're a patient? Uh, now, signal detection theory is a way of answering that question. Now, you might say, well, how can you answer it if you're uncertain? I mean, only God knows for sure. But what it does is it advises you on what cutoff of probability you should uh, use as your threshold for deciding one way or another, depending on the costs and benefits of the different kinds of error. Gu guilty beyond reasonable doubt, say, for example. Well, the, the, or, or even more to the point, in the case of, say, um, medical decision, where there's the uncertainty, what you would have to think of is how bad would it be if you, if you were wrong in, uh, in um, having a miss, that is, there is a cancer, but you don't operate. How bad would it be if there was a false alarm, namely there's no cancer, but you do operate? And in, in the case of, say, a radical mastectomy, the costs are, are substantial, they're not, they're not uh, trivial. Um, now in the courtroom, the, oh, and by the way, so just, just to cap off that story, signal detection theory uh, basically advises having a um, a low cutoff, being kind of trigger happy, acting even uh, when, when you're highly uncertain, if the costs of a miss are high and the costs of a false alarm are low. If it's the other way around, then you want to be gun shy. You want to have a very high burden of proof before you actually act on something. Now, whether, and there's some, there's some mathematics behind it, not, not that complicated, but where it does uh, where it already is recognized is in the legal arena, not quantitatively, where when we say better one uh, guilty um, man be, sorry, better 10 of the guilty be acquitted than one innocent be convicted, Blackstone's ratio, that is an example of setting a criterion, a threshold, a decision cutoff based on, not on your degree of uh, credence in the, in, the, um, in the guilt. This is what you do after you have a degree of belief, how you act on it. And this crucially depends on your values. In the case of, uh, say, a cancer diagnosis, it's uh, you know, how, how much would it suck if you failed to detect a, a cancer? How much would it suck if you um, had unnecessary surgery? That's a subjective, it's value-based. In the case of a court of law, there's the moral valuation of how horrific would it be to send a innocent man to jail or to the to, to, uh, for countries that have capital punishment to the electric chair versus how bad would it be if you had a murderer walking uh, among us? And, and the tradition has been this 10 to 1 ratio. There's no, that is not, where you get the values, and this gets back to Hume, is not itself a matter of rationale, at least not in any simple way. It's a matter of what we, what we value, in this case, morally. Beyond <coughs> reasonable doubt, I've always worried about that because you feel if it really was beyond reasonable doubt, um, when the jury come out and there's great tension in the court, there shouldn't be any tension in the court if it's beyond reasonable doubt. Everybody in the court should know whether it's, whether it's guilty <laughs> yes. or, or not. Another way to put that would be, if you imagine having two juries independently listening to the same evidence and then disappearing into their own jury rooms and then coming back, how many times would you bet they'd come back with the same verdict? You, you, we probably don't want to know the answer. Well, quite. Because <laughs> yeah. it, it, is, it is depressingly uh, low. So the beyond a reasonable doubt, you know, this actually, and, and these are, like many of the issues surrounding the applicability of rational tools, this is highly consequential. In the United States, there has been a <coughs> raging debate over a, um, a memo issued by the Obama in, uh, administration called the Dear Colleague Letter uh, pertaining to accusations of, um, of uh, sexual assault on campus, overturning the beyond a reasonable doubt standard to preponderance of evidence sometimes called 50% plus a feather. Now, uh, the, and I think the, uh, it wasn't Obama himself, but the bureaucrats of the administration who changed that rule uh, did not think through the signal detection analysis or statistical decision analysis. All they thought of was, damn it, we've got to um, punish more 
uh, people who are guilty of sexual assault. What didn't seem to occur to them is if all you do is you change the standard of proof, you will punish more uh, guilty men, you'll also punish more innocent men. Yes. That is unavoidable, it's just a fact of mathematics, um, and that the failure to think through the moral value of a false acquittal and a false conviction led to the prematurely, the, the, the glib um, ch change of standard. Then a number of in, uh, investigative journalists turned up all of these cases of patently innocent men being convicted, um, kicked out of, uh, out of university, their lives uh, ruined, and, and then it's been revoked by the Trump administration, then might be reinstituted by the Biden administration. But uh, whether or not it's advisable is, should hinge on an overt discussion of how bad is it to convict a, an innocent person, how bad is it to an acqu acquit a guilty one. If you don't have that in mind, then the decision, should it be beyond a reasonable doubt or preponderance of evidence, is not being done rationally. One of the quotes I picked up from the book is, we evolved as intuitive lawyers, not as intuitive scientists. Um, I think I see what that means. Yes. This was, um, I think it was uh, the, the uh, cognitive anthropologist Dan Sperber, but and Phil, Philip Tetlock, another cognitive psychologist, um, uh, said it in slightly different words. We're also intuitive theologians. Uh, so uh, a lawyer tries to press her case as using whatever trick works, that that's a responsibility. The idea is that if they're in an adversarial system, the uh, lawyer on the other side will push back and the truth will emerge from um, both advocates making their strongest possible argument. And it's actually an interesting question whether that really does lead to uh, 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 correct verdicts from that adversarial process. Now that also happens in science. It shouldn't, but it does. There are scientific debates where um, the disagreeing scientists act like lawyers, they pull out every trick they can think of, but it's an aspiration to science that you don't do that. And uh, the question is, we are human, and we humans are so uh, set on making our truth the truth, and this goes back to the my side bias, it's uh, the more general rubric is motivated reasoning, that is, instead of following the evidence and logic to where it leads, you start off with the conclusion that you want to be true, and you jigger and spin doctor and um, um, uh, jury rig the evidence to, to take you there. Uh, the, uh, the, the idea that we are uh, intuitive lawyers is that, uh, that we don't necessarily follow the trail of evidence to the most defensible conclusion, but we, all of us, want the certain things to be true, and we're ingenious at um, arguing for them. Now, that is a kind of rationality in the sense that, again, rationality is always in pursuit of the goal. Ideally, the goal should be disinterested truth, but for any given person at any given time, it might be to show how smart you are, how wise you are, to argue for a conclusion that, that favors you, why you should get the contract and not someone else, why you should go to the restaurant that is near um, your house and not the, 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 the other person's house. All of these are examples of motivated reasoning which make us very good lawyers and, and not such good scientists intuitively. It's part of the Darwinian point that we're evolved to, to best our rivals at, at argument. Yes, and in fact, that it, it is a, um, it, it's another profound point. My, my late colleague, Jerry Fodor, a philosopher who was at uh, MIT and then at, uh, at Rutgers, uh, one of his objections to uh, um, evolutionary explanations of cog cognition is that he said there's, there's nothing to discuss. The only selection pressure, uh, if, if you want to even go there, is, is truth, is, is uh, objective truth. Um, sad to say that isn't true, uh, that there, is an advantage to being in touch with reality as opposed to being deluded. But in arenas where you can't establish the fact of the matter with certainty, there's also can be an advantage to, being, to, being, to winning an argument even if you aren't objectively correct. Namely, you get your way. Uh, or, you, or you enhance your status, your reputation for expertise and knowledge. 
And so I think Jerry was a little too charitable to the rationality of our species, although I agree with him that it's also false to say that we can't be rational because the only thing that we evolved to do was to run away from lions. Going back to the uh, my side bias again, it's been suggested that um, there is a Darwinian advantage in sucking up to your own side because what really matters, since we're social animals, is, is to be successful in our social group, whether or not what we believe is true. If we, if we can increase our prestige in the social group to which we belong, that could have a Darwinian benefit. That's another very pessimistic thought, actually. It is, and, and, and there's got to be a lot of truth to that, given that empirical evidence that the my side bias is as powerful as it is, the most powerful bias. But it does lead to a more optimistic um, conclusion, namely, given you know, humans are what you are, you can't just ask someone and, ex and, and expect them to, to um, know the truth, even if they're smart, because they might just use their intelligence to come up with a self-serving conclusion. But there are institutions where we can uh, use the, uh, our argumentative abilities to their advantage uh, to try to al allow the truth to emerge from disputation. That is the logic behind the adversarial system in a courtroom, that yeah, you've got a lawyer, he's gonna, uh, or she's gonna pull out every, every trick that, that uh, she can. On the other hand, there's a lawyer on the other side, and there's a jury, and they listen to them, and the best argument will come out from their disputation. Or in science, where we have um, uh, peer review and a demand for empirical validation. In governance, where we have um, uh, checks and balances, separation of powers, open debate in parliament, the idea is that you deploy people's ability to poke holes in the other side, and even if they're not so good at poking holes in their own side, uh, as long as you have freedom of speech, freedom of the press, then uh, you can deploy people's critical faculties to, uh, to, to debunk or disprove false ideas, and the idea left standing would be the true one. Uh, and, and so this is uh, one of the conclusions in, in um, rationality, both in answer to the question, how can uh, a, a species that is so saddled with biases and fallacies uh, managed to discover DNA and the theory of evolution and get I'm to the moon London, yeah. and, and, and the smartphones and, and vaccines and so on. Um, part of the answer is it isn't any one of us that did that. It's communities of um, thinkers who get to expose fallacies in one another and that the whole society or institution can be more rational than any of its uh, members. Conversely, what allows uh, nonsense to proliferate, it's precisely the arenas in which there isn't a, a evaluation of ideas. Um, in dictatorships which suppress freedom of speech, then you can have uh, the autocrats with lunatic ideas like, like Putin, like, like uh, Mao, perhaps like uh, even Xi Jinping in today's China. If you insulate yourself from criticism, you have dis disabled the social mechanism that can make us more rational despite our self-serving biases. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. Um, I think we'd better stop and ask for questions. This is not the first time Steve and I have appeared on stage together, by the way. In, in London, a few years ago, we did, and um, it, it went pretty well, and uh, the BBC got wind of it afterwards, and they rang up and said, would we like to reprise our encounter on news night that evening. So we said yes. And then I got a phone call from the producer and she said, tell me what exactly is the nature of your disagreement with Dr. Pinker? <laughs> and I said, um, I don't think we really have much of a disagreement. And she said, no disagreement. And the interview was pro promptly canceled. <laughs> That's right. Well, <laughs> And that I, was, it was it, is science killing the soul? I think that was the resolution. I forget what it was, but, it, but anyway, um, I haven't been pushing back. And, actually, I do agree with you <laughs> about everything. Um, questions? <clears throat> Can we have the lights up? Thank you. So I, to take your last point, I'm used to where there are societies in which free exchange of views are not permitted, I mean, and therefore that can lead you to fallacy. 
not that everything should come back to the American political system, I mean, just a, but, but we're, so it seems like we're in a stage, I mean, just to where half, maybe even more than half of sort of the American electorate has turned their back on the idea of rationality. I mean, the, the idea that, that, you know, not just scientific evidence, I mean, just to the, but, but really, I mean, just to the, if you look at sort of January 6th, I mean, just to the, you know, what you see, I mean, just to, that is, is somehow not true. So what is, you can, can argue that in a society where sort of it's, you know, authoritarian, I mean, that might change and you might sort of have a, a path back to a more rational society. What happens when society that has freedom of the press, I mean, just has elections, I mean, just, but turns its back on rationality anyway. I mean, just what's the way forward? Yeah, the, the way, and, and it, it, is, it is indeed worrying that the my side bias is uh, just so um, overwhelming that it can lead people to um, almost hallucinate things that didn't happen with, with uh, significant consequences. This isn't just an um, uh, idle belief in, in uh, but, um, but you know, le led to violence and, and um, could lead to uh, insurrection. Uh, now, the way I think of it is that it's not as if there was a, a golden age in which we are all rational and we're um, uh, this sudden pernicious threat. I think it's easier to think that at least in the political arena, uh, the default is that, we, that we're all victims of the my side bias we ought to support the disinterested institutions like perhaps the rationalia or uh, uh, open debate, empirical evaluation that would um, uh, pull us away from our, uh, our uh, self-serving bias. And, but they're, they're fragile. They, we always are in danger of backsliding into conspiracy theories, into demonization of the other side. And we really have to safeguard the institutions of rationality, such as a responsible and free press, such as government record keeping, such as um, science. But it is always, there is always something Sisyphean about it in that human nature always um, uh, regresses to the, to a, the my side bias. Uh, Another question. <clears throat> Thank you so much for such an insightful discussion tonight. Um, I've got a question about, um, it seems that as a society we often uh, fall into the habit of being in um, echo chambers and just wanted to ask on your, your opinion about how can we combat this in order to exchange ideas and not fall um, victims of uh, our own biases. Yes, and, and I'm sorry for not making eye contact, but I actually don't know where the question Upstairs, came from. In the up, up in the balcony? Okay. Um, yeah, it, it is a, a profound question, and there is, um, I think there was probably a premature conclusion that social media sucked people into the so-called filter bubbles, if you don't mind the, the mixed metaphor, um, especially that the recommendation algorithms would lead people down extremist rabbit holes. Uh, it turns out that the studies of what people are exposed to on the internet show that that's probably not generally the case. That's not why uh, the, the main way but that people get radicalized. That in fact, on the internet, you're more likely to be exposed to both mainstream and opposing viewpoints than in the old days when a, a, a hunk of paper was delivered to your doorstep and you could subscribe either to the Telegraph or to the Guardian and never see the other one. Uh, now, either one is a click away. And in fact, empirically, it turns out that people are exposed to, uh, they actually are exposed to um, a, a, a diversity of opinion. It's not enough to get them to adopt the mindset of um, rationalia, of let, let's see where the evidence goes. The my side bias still uh, uh, keeps people uh, uh, wedded to their convictions. So there has to be something beyond just exposure. There has to be, uh, and when people, uh, ask me what is the, um, how do we make people more rational? I mean, not, not that I have a, a, a cure or a, a solution, but I have some suggestions, and they're suggestions made by others. Certainly one of them is to safeguard the credibility of the truth-establishing institutions, given that uh, all of us being human, none of us is going to be capable of being perf perfectly rational. So the, um, the news agencies themselves, the government agencies, the public health officials, 
the universities, the scientific societies, um, ought to be prepared to show their work, to show why they come to the conclusion, conclusions they do so that there's at least some chance that others can replicate their uh, rationality to the extent that it is rational. They should avoid gratuitous politicization, and I think it is quite pernicious that a lot of our um, scientific, academic, and journalistic outlets are just branding themselves as mouthpieces of the left, because what it will mean is the right will blow them off. And when it comes to sciences that both of us care deeply about, evolution and, and uh, anthropogenic climate change, uh, it, uh, we know that this is pernicious because Denial of the scientific consensus in, on evolution or climate change has nothing to do with scientific literacy. And despite your best efforts and my best efforts and, and the best efforts of many to uh, enhance the understanding of science, you, you, the Emeritus Chair of the, of the, uh, for the Public Understanding of Science in, in, at Oxford, uh, something that is highly desirable, but public understanding of science won't, sadly, get more people to believe in evolution or anthropogenic climate change, because tests of public understanding of science show that the deniers know as much science as the uh, acceptors. The people who accept evolution have only the vaguest idea how it really works. A Andrew Stolman has shown that, there, that people who affirm uh, what you and I would agree is the, is the correct belief um, have all kinds of cockamamie ideas about how evolution works. Conversely for, uh, or I mean similarly I should say for, for climate change, you ask a typical advocate of a believer, what causes climate change? You won't get a coherent explanation of the greenhouse effect all the time. You'll, you might get, well, does that have something to do with, is it the ozone hole or plastic straws in the ocean? I mean, people have kind of a sense of green versus pollution. Uh, and conversely, the deniers often are um, kind of skilled litigators who know every loophole in the science. Uh, what predicts your degree of belief in climate change is how far are you to the left or to the right. The uh, farther you are to the right, the more denial. Now, if, now that's a sad fact about our species. Again, it's the my side bias. It's a tragic fact. A tragic fact. But what it means is, how do we get people to accept the scientific consensus? And that is, stop branding it as a left-wing talking point. Uh, get people on the right who endorse it or establish the um, political neutrality, the political bona fides of the scientific societies, the public health agencies, and I think that's not only have we not met that challenge, but we're uh, careening in the wrong direction. And next question. Thank you. Uh, you've got me thinking about when you were talking about empiricism and rationalism. Uh, the empiricism, I understand, is, is when you have a blank state. Uh, a blank in, state. in the cognitive science sense of empiricism, rationalism, probably not the philosopher's sense. Uh, what I'm thinking is um, a child, I imagine, is a blank state. At what point does, does, that, uh, does it start differentiating? At what point... Do, does a child become rational or non-rational? Or has there been any studies done? I mean, uh, how does it uh, relate to education? How, uh, all, all the other discussions about the me yeah. side, you know, uh, left and right, and you know, all these ideas are taught to children. At what point do these things get yeah. fixed in, in, some, in, in a child's the, mind? We've got the point. Yes. So I think um, uh, certainly many of my colleagues in, in developmental cognitive science would dispute the claim that babies are blank slates. And my, my colleague Elizabeth Spelke, as a, a brilliant scientist using ingenious methods, has shown that um, babies from as young as you can test them, in some cases newborns, probably have... Uh, ways of organizing the world, like the concept of object, the concept of causation. Um, newborns um, uh, lock onto faces. They have already um, acquired the sound pattern of their language. So I wouldn't go so far as to say that children, children are blank slates. It's certainly true that they don't know particular policies to say nothing of empirical beliefs like is human activity warming the planet. So that obviously has to be acquired. Um, and it is uh, schooling matters, 
ambient culture matters, what you just, what you hear in, you know, in, in, in pubs and bars and coffee houses, um, what you see on, on, uh, on television or on the internet. So there are lots of sources of uh, conventional wisdom. And I, ideally, they ought to be deployed in the direction of greater rationality, that is, calibrating a belief to evidence, um, and that is kind of the, aspira the, the rationality aspiration. Uh, there's a question at the front. Oh, I have a question here in the back. Sorry. Uh, so, Thanks. hello, Professor Where, where, should I, I'm sorry, where, where am hello, I looking? Professor Pinker. Can someone uh, wave? Here in the corner up. A uh, balcony? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I see. You know, so the, the, the bright light is uh, blinding me anyway, but, but I'll, I'll look in that direction. Yes, yeah, so. <laughs> uh, thank you for today's discussion. Uh, you started it by talking about evolutionary psychology and the controversy surrounding this field. So I have a question about your field of expertise or one of your fields of expertise, evolutionary psychology. Uh, so modern evolutionary psychologists such as uh, you or David Buss or Geoffrey Miller uh, believe that our skulls host a Stone Age mind um, and uh, uh, you look for mental adaptations that was, were forged by natural and sexu sexual selection in the evolutionary environment of adaptation, or the EEA, which according to my knowledge is the place to sin. Do you believe that future evolutionary psychologists will be interested in a different evolutionary environment of adaptation? How do you see the future of the field and uh, how do, how do you know that the current EEA that we study is still relevant in 2022? Yeah, it, it's a, a, a surprisingly pointed question because it, it, I have had a friendly disagreement with my friends Lita Cosmides and John Tooby, the two of the co-founders of evolutionary psychology, over whether the environment of evolutionary adaptiveness, um, that is the uh, the world of cause and effect that shaped our psychological adaptations, that actually determined our reproductive output, should be equated with the Pleistocene, with the with hunter-gatherers, with the, 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 the Stone Agers. Uh, I, I, that, that may be true, but I actually think it's somewhat gratuitous because so many of the mismatches that motivate evolutionary explanations. For example, to take a not so controversial example, why do we have a sweet tooth? Why do we consume more salt and fat than is good for us? A common answer, and it's uh, an evolutionary answer, is that um, in the world in which we evolved, there weren't mass uh, quantities of affordable, ubiquitous sweets. Uh, the uh, danger, rather, was insufficient calories. We evolved a sweet tooth. In our current environment, in which sweet foods are abundant, we uh, consume too much of it. It used to be the world that limited our supply. Now the world no longer limits our supply. Notice that you don't need um, the Stone Age. You don't need the Pleistocene. You don't need hunter-gatherers for that explanation, because mass production of um, foods with synthetic sugar is only maybe 100 years old. So even if you count the EEA as everything up to, uh, I don't know, you know whatever, whenever candy became uh, cheap and, and ubiquitous, uh, let's say 1950, you could say it's everything up to 1950. And it's still the case that the whatever time-weighted um, uh, periods uh, had an effect on our sweet tooth, we know that it, uh, it wasn't the present just because there have only been a few generations in which that has, uh, the, we've had that innovation. Likewise for reliable contraception. Why do uh, people have um, sexual liaisons that um, might make them unhappy? Well, in uh, say, um, men who are indiscriminate in seeking multiple sexual partners would have had more offspring. Uh, that is no longer even adaptive in terms of maximizing reproductive output in a world of contraception. Now, um, at, but the fact that some of our sexual desires are not so adaptive can be explained by the mismatch between the world we now live in with adoption and contraception and other way in vitro fertilization and the world in which we evolved. Now again, you actually don't have to go back to the Pleistocene. You just have to go back to the invention of the birth control pill in 1962 or whenever it was. So, and, and I think for so many of the mismatch hypotheses, the mismatch, mismatched environment hypotheses that give evolutionary psychology its 
um, explanatory power, namely, you can't explain human behavior by current rationality. Often you can explain it by rationality in a world that no longer exists. That world doesn't have to be the Pleistocene. It could be everything up to 100 years ago. And that's true for uh, widespread literacy, very recent in human history, but again, not so recent as the transition from hunting and gathering to settled agriculture. Um, it, it, it's, it's in many parts of the world, it's still happening. The, thirst for revenge as opposed to the availing yourself of a criminal justice system. Again, cr reliable criminal justice systems and police forces are, you can measure them in centuries. Uh, the fact that most people, most times, and most of the world didn't have them, the uh, hunter-gatherer hypothesis is not f necessarily false, but it's, it's uh, gratuitous. I'm afraid we have run out of time. Um, it's been a very serious discussion, but I shouldn't let you go, go away with the idea that it's only serious. It is actually a very funny book, lots of good jokes. Um, Shut up, he explained. I love that. <laughs> um, a list of tall tales that some people believe. I laughed out loud at Woman Sues Samsung for $1.8 million after cell phone gets stuck in her vagina. <laughs> What I like fake. is that she sued $1.8 million for that. Fake, fake news. These are examples of real, I mean, they're real examples of fake news. Yes, okay. Um, and there's no time for the Sydney Morton Morgan Besser story, but too bad. Um, I think we've seen, amply seen, why Steve Pinker is my favorite public intellectual. Thank you very, very much, Steve. Thank you. Thank you.